We acknowledge, celebrate and pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First People on whose traditional lands we meet and work. Their cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We also acknowledge and celebrate that many of the speakers in this series were based on other traditional lands and territories across Australia and the world. We recognise their past and present leaders and acknowledge their contribution to our collective past and futures. Welcome to Cybernetic Snacks, a speaker series featuring leading voices in the cybernetics conversation. We're currently exploring the past, present and future of cybernetics. A complex blend of computational neuroscience, systems of systems and cybernetic futures. Today, we're in conversation with Michael Arbib. We've asked Michael four questions. Let's get started. So the first question that was posed is why cybernetics for me? And it goes back to, uh, I suppose, Norbert Wiener uh, back in the late uh, 50s. I read his book and became very intrigued in his approach to control and communication in animal and machine as something mathematical. I was a mathematics undergraduate in Sydney at the time. And so when it came uh, as a choice of where to go to graduate school, I went to MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and for a while was uh, Wiener's PhD student before he disappeared on, on sabbatical. It was only later I discovered that there was a very different form of cybernetics, which was espoused at the Macy meetings from 49 to 53. And I, I use these terms. Oh, okay. They call it circular causal and feedback mechanisms in biological and social systems. But the point was that what I had identified with, and, and I think where I've made many of my contributions is what you might call hard cybernetics in the sense that you have to know mathematics and all that nonsense. And Wiener, von Neumann, McCulloch, and Shannon were among the names. And then that I contrast with that with without any pejorative intent, uh, soft cybernetics, uh, less mathematical, von Furster, Mead, and Bateson, where anthropology, sociology, family dynamics were involved. And what, what is confusing me and what I hope we can uh, discuss with various people here today is what, what the hell is cybernetics now? It seems to be an umbrella term that covers insights from brain research, neural networks, artificial intelligence, computer networks, robotic, blah, 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 right? So many things. Okay, so, so here's sort of a, a schema of my early days. Um, we have the book of 1948 on cybernetics. This is the cover of the second edition that came out in 1961, about the time I arrived at a graduate student uh, at MIT. And I was invited back to New South Wales, UNSW in 62. And so in the middle of that year, I gave a series of lectures called Brains, Machines and Mathematics that became my first book published in 64, but it's sort of exciting to be here in Australia talking about cybernetics on the 60th anniversary of those uh, first lectures. And then 10 years later, so 50th anniversary, um, I had the book called The Metaphorical Brain, and, and this sort of gives my bias away, an introduction to cybernetics as artificial intelligence and brain theory. And part of the discussion will be, what does that mean? And part of the discussion will be, well, how do we place cybernetics in a larger context than, than that particular emphasis? So um, an early interest was in the mathematics defined for neural networks by McCulloch and Pitts and for general theory of computation by Alan Turing. And so my, my first technical paper was neural nets, finite automata, and Turing machines. And while I was at MIT, uh, McCulloch became sort of my guru and, and probably the biggest influence on me during those days. Though one of the exciting aspects, which I think your school is trying to recreate, is the idea that people from many different disciplines are on good terms with each other and can talk and try to understand each other. Uh, but a, another contrast uh, at that time that was very interesting is that Jerry Letvin and Umberto Maturana, a neurophysiologist and um, anatomist inspired by the work of McCulloch and Pitts were working on the neuroscience of the frog and their work looked in terms of the output cells, the ganglion cells of the frog being um, action-oriented. So here were cells that seemed to respond best to a, a prey object. Here were the ones that seemed to respond best to a predator. Whereas just across the river at Harvard Medical School, David Hubel and Torsten Weasel, who later got the, the Nobel Prize for their work, were looking at early stages of visual processing in cat and later monkey, where it seems to be sort of general purpose. How do you find basic features that can be used to recognize almost anything? But that theme of 
thinking about perception, not in terms of here's vision, what's out there, but perception related to action. So even in the Hubel Weasel story, well, how does that lead to other brain regions that are involved in the ongoing behavior of the creature? And then learning in neural nets, I must say, I was not as aware of that area, although that's become dominant, I would say, in neural networks now. But I was certainly interested in what Frank Rosenblatt had to say about perceptron. But Donald Hebb, whose idea that neurons that fire together, wire together, was not as much a part of my consciousness until a few years later. But here are people who are very central to my, well, two of the three. Um, John von Neumann was, a, as we all know, a mathematical genius, but also came up with the idea of the stored program computer. And here he is working with Robert Oppenheimer, who led the Manhattan Project, where early calculations were so important to the first atomic bomb. And then on the right-hand side, we had Claude Shannon, um, who was the founder of the mathematical theory of communication, where communication is not how do I get the semantics of the message across, but how do I get the, the bits and bobs, the, the words or, or, or other visual signals or whatever across accurately. And just uh, as an aside, I will say that once when I was rowing on a pond, I capsized and Claude Shannon got on his bicycle and recognized me. And uh, you can each try to form a mental image of that. Okay, I've listed here transformative technologies for brain theory. Just uh, It was only in 49 that recording from single cells came up. It's only some years later that uh, molecular biology became involved, the genetics of the nervous system. EEG had been around since the 20s and 30s, but actually imaging the active brain um, with PET and then fMRI and now all the new developments. Uh, robotics was very primitive until a few years ago, but now it becomes a test bed. And I should claim that there's a very inferior robot, but I love it because its name is Arbib. And it turns out my name is an acronym for autonomous robot based on inspiration from biology. Oh, well, enough. Okay. What's my favorite tool approach theory text person story from cybernetics and why? Oh my God. Um, I can't pick anything. Uh, let me just, I picked, sort of four things from, from the air. One is, I think, the mathematical system theory. Uh, Norbert Wiener, in relation to his work on cybernetics, came up with the Second World War theory of the interpolation, extrapolation uh, of time series. Um, he contributed to feedback. And then Rudolf Kalman came along and gave the modern theory of Wiener's work in which the notion of internal state and internal models and so on became primary. And, and Kalman was my uh, postdoc, my second postdoc advisor at Stanford. Uh, neural prostheses, Australia has the important role in developing cochlear implants. Now we're up to the stage where we can make human robot linkages that allow neural control of robot arms, even with tactile feedback. Perhaps for the future of the world, just the huge advance in simulation technology where we're looking at very large and complex networks, not just as a feedback loop or a feed forward system, but huge systems and the ability to, to simulate them. And so we now not only have surprisingly, but not always consistently accurate weather forecasts, but we have uh, the ability to track the implications of climate change and so on, and, and huge insights. And then finally, um, all the work we did on understanding how uh, brains learn uh, became uh, the basis for what is called deep learning, uh, which turned AI from um, a sort of nice intellectual idea uh, to a transformative technology in society today. But it's important to realize that the ideas um, of uh, learning in neural networks on which deep learning is based were all well in place uh, in the 1990s. And it was the huge progress in computer technology, communication technology, databases and so on that made uh, the current uh, work in AI possible. Uh, and, and I think some of you who've looked at the history of the subject know the irony that uh, Marvin Minsky, who was one of the pioneers of, um, of, neural, uh, of artificial intelligence, and in fact wrote on neural networks before he became a on the faculty at MIT, um, he wrote a paper with, or a little book with Seymour Papert that sort of decried learning. And, and for a while, people in AI thought that learning was not part of their concern. Of course, times have changed. And I, I should just, again, on a personal note, say that the day I arrived 
um, at MIT uh, and visited Minsky. Um, he was opening the reprints. I don't know whether many of you are old enough to know what that means, but anyway, reprints of the paper called Steps Towards Artificial Intelligence. So I, I think I can claim that I've not contributed as much to artificial intelligence as I should perhaps, but at least I was there at the beginning. Okay, cybernetics present. One example of where I've applied cybernetics, seen cybernetics applied to create shape and or improve something we see in the world around us today. Well, I'm not going to go into my own work here, but I just want to pick up on the word improve and say, unfortunately, it's not just improvement. And uh, just as uh, to pick up on one aspect of this, um, here's a very good book review from the New York Review of Books in which a woman with the incredible name of Zephyr Teach Out um, reviews several books, including The Battle for Uber. And, and what she calls private government, that's a very interesting concept, the idea that there are now um, companies whose reach, well, there have always been companies like this, but now enhanced by AI technology that can rule lives even more than we could before. And then Jeff Bezos and Amazon. And I, the general theme there is that for many workers now, um, in America at least, uh, other countries too, I'm sure, um, there's been a tradition which has allowed the unions to become so weak that there is nothing to protect the workers from um, the bosses. And now we have situations where with cameras and keystroke counting and so on, every piece of um, work that a person is doing can be monitored um, moment by moment and draconian uh, rules of working that take the humanity out of being this. It was interesting, I was in a workplace yesterday, uh, well, not yesterday, a few days ago um, uh, at a, a medical um, group. And there I was just so struck as how efficient everybody was, yet at the same time, th there were little bits of gossip going on and human interaction. And, and so that seems to be a real challenge of uh, how do we get the technology which allows us to push things to the limit of supervising humans as if they too were parts of the machine and balance uh, the useful efficiency that can provide with the concern for human interaction. So uh, I, I sort of add to this, the hard lesson is that politics are unavoidable, whether it's the, the politics of how do you get a country together on climate change after being run by somebody who is opposed to climate change. This is a, as applicable here in Australia as it was back in California and America, um, but also at the level of bosses and so on. So the use of cybernetics uh, it says you can come up with an efficient system. What's the goal? And uh, of course, the, one of the big challenges of cybernetics is that in general, a system does not like the classic feedback uh, and later feed forward systems of early cybernetics. It doesn't have um, a single goal to be optimized. So you've got multiple goals. How do you trade them off? And of course, what's operating as it were diagonally on this system is the power structures that ensure that in general, only some people will have their needs met. Will bosses ensure their profits and ignore the well-being of workers? Will the city grow to satisfy, to satisfy the needs of the poor or homeless and only the wealthy and powerful? Um, if you have housing for workers, um, is that being done to really meet the well-being of the inhabitants? And I must say, <laughs> After four years of Trump and seeing how many people in the Republican Party are still uh, insanely um, devoted to his every false word, I, I do wonder if in America democracy is viable and what that means for our design of future cybernetic systems with impacts on real human beings. Okay, so cybernetics future. Um, what's one thing I would remove or do differently? in shaping a cybernetics for the 20th century. I carefully had a timer on, but now my iPad has gone to sleep, but I think I'm 15, I, I'm going too fast, I'm going too fast. Well, I'm sorry, but there'll be time for more questions, I suppose, or I can just make things up at the end. Okay. So <laughs> I say, you can ask me for one thing that's important in the future, and I say, one? My God. 
but uh, yeah, well, all right. So, okay. So, so what I, I've suggested as sort of the key challenge to me is, is how do you master the dual perspective of the Wiener cybernetics, the hard headed cybernetics, which really understands control systems, really understands the neuroscience of the brain, really understands computer networks with what I'll call Mead Bateson cybernetics, where, where you've really worked with real people in real situations in different cultures. And you, you don't necessarily have much of a mathematical handle on it, but you've got a lot of data, a lot of intuitions. And how, how do we bring those two together? And I just note from this history that only a couple of years after publishing the classic book on cybernetics, um, Norbert Wiener um, wrote The Human Use of Human Beings. It's interesting, the, the professor at UNSW, John Blatt, who invited me to give my 1962 lectures, was shocked by this title. He said, you can't use human beings. That's not what human beings are for. But of course, the problem is we are in social structures where people are continually being used by others. And so the issue of how, when you've introduced cybernetics into the mix, how does that affect um, the way in which human beings interact and the way in which one can improve uh, power structures rather than allow them to become more destructive? Um, as I showed you before, 72 was where I, in some sense, formulated my, my notion of cybernetics as um, artificial intelligence and brain theory. In 77, I, I tried to express at book length in a textbook uh, my thoughts about computers and the cybernetic society. And I, I think it's interesting to look at Lee Cooprider's review of the 77 edition. Um, he said, well, he took a good political stand on the Privacy Act. And uh, he had some reasonable moral views on the use of computers to facilitate political repression or steal people's money. But then I, I highlighted in blue, but the analysis is provided on an item by item basis without establishing an underlying political theory in which to embed the discussion. And so I, I, I note that uh, weakness uh, that I exhibited uh, back then to make the point about the challenge of cybernetics, if you agree that you must find a home in which we learn from the, the Wiener style cybernetics and the Mead Bates and cybernetics and the modern advances in computer networks and artificial intelligence and take advance of uh, uh, notice of climate change and so on, how the hell do you do it? And how do we build educational structures and then professional structures in which the expertise is all there, but people um, nonetheless can work together in teams. Um, a fellow named Carl Hewitt back in the 70s working on distributed computation had the idea of contracts. Um, as a technical notion, the notion you've got applied to computers, but equally I think applied to teams of people where how do you ensure that each person says, if I will do something, they really can do it and will do it, and you can trust the result, even though you don't have the technical ability to understand what they're doing? So how do we get to the stage where someone with my initial background can trust a sociologist or anthropologist to offer general insight rather than the particular tribe or particular company they studied? Uh, and conversely, how can they trust me or, or someone like me who is an expert on artificial intelligence or robotics or control theory. But again, will the person in control theory really know very much about artificial intelligence? And so it goes. So that issue of what is the, this is really what I hope to discover today as the ANU formula, the Canberra formula is what is the basic knowledge that has to be shared to be able to form the contracts with the people who know more about those topics so that when you are working in a team, you, you can work together. So that seems to me perhaps the key challenge from looking at cybernetics from the, the educational perspective. Another question going right back to 1964, I, I had what I would call the, the sad good fortune that when my book came out, uh, the first book, Brains, Machines, and Mathematics, it came out at the time Norbert Wiener died. So suddenly cybernetics was very much in the air, and then a book coming out on cybernetics at that very moment uh, received the attention of Jacob Brunowski, who, who was a big contributor to the uh, public education in science, I would say. And so he wrote the lead review in The Scientific American. And again, he liked some things about the book, but he complained it did not contain the new mathematics appropriate to the study of the brain. Now, a 30-minute 
cyber snack is not the place to discuss what might be in the mathematics of the brain. It's probably something of the boulevards with a touch of the pebble over. But um, so, but but I just offer that not as a discussion. I think probably for today, but but as a crucial challenge of where we go with cybernetics is what is the mathematics of the brain? Um, one of the answers would be, for example, nonlinear dynamical systems, which really uh, were over in mathematics and the work of Poincaré and so on back in the 40s and 50s, but hadn't really entered the mainstream of mathematics thought. And then there's that whole area of, method, of, of category theory and algebraic treatment of machines and languages and so on. And um, now we have the a lot of people are uh, devoted to Bayes theorem. So we can we can come up with those and then we can say, now what of those are the mathematics of cybernetics? What of those can be lifted as it were from not only the brain, but the brain as doing something within a larger social system? And then what are the new uh, techniques to be involved? So it, maybe it would be a very interesting conference for you to have here in Canberra on uh, a, a more technical set of issues, but what are the mathematics of cybernetics? Okay. Now, again, I, I was I haven't yet been able to get a straight answer on what the hell you mean by cybernetics here. So I thought, well, I would go to Wikipedia, the source of all modern knowledge. And here are some of the disciplines that it offered of what the definition of, I'm not gonna read the definitions, but just cyber crime, cyber attack, cyber bullying, cyber culture, cyberpunk. Cybersecurity, cyber sex, trafficking, cyberspace, cyber stalking, cyber terrorism, cyber warfare. Okay, now if you're going to have courses on all of those, um, good luck. But continuing, I, I got all the articles whose title starts with cyber, and this is just a partial list. And so I, I tried to understand um, what is the common thread, and actually it's just Primarily, anything whose operation is based crucially on the linkage of diverse people or infrastructure in computer networks. So there's nothing in there that necessarily harks back to that deep history of the Wiener cybernetics uh, and, and the Josiah Macy extension of that cybernetics to include the, the anthropologists and sociologists. Um, so I, I really do raise the sense, is there any meaningful sense in which cybernetics exists as a distinct field in the 2020s? Is it going to be a label which entices us to think modern computational thoughts, or is it really um, something which, uh, as I hoped is the case, allows us to come back and look at basic principles about um, control systems and the brain and basic principles about social interactions and that can be integrated into an overall framework of basic knowledge that can be uh, taught to people in the future as a firm grounding for approaching to, to many, perhaps not all of the, I'm not sure a cyber enhanced working dog is necessarily important, but uh, cyber security is clearly something and cyber surveillance are clearly topics that do come under your concern. So that's the end of, of what I have to say in answer to the four questions or in partial answer to the four questions, uh, but to advertise that I do have another talk while I'm here in, in the school. And it's got lots of buzzwords, systems of systems, architectural atmosphere, neuromorphic architecture. But the question is, what do those buzzwords mean? And, and what do they mean for the well-being of humans and ecospheres? So the notion is that now that more and more people are aware, not only of their own comfort, but of the fact that our planet is being battered by uh, the way people are trying to live, that uh, we uh, need to, to develop new principles. And I have to confess that um, I used to be a mathematician, but I'm not. And so what I have this afternoon will not be a set of principles waiting to be plugged in, but as I say, a new vocabulary, which I hope will help us extend our cybernetics concerns to this overall challenge of ensuring the well-being of humans in a way that ties into the well-being of the ecosphere. And that is that. Want more? Check out the snack pack in the video description for bonus content and resources. Ow.